Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan, and welcome to Central Park. Now, we know that getting to Central Park is still pretty difficult for a lot of people, so we want to make it a little bit easier by bringing the park to you through a series of virtual programs, like our longer 45-minute virtual programs, as well as our shorter, more informal 15-minute or about 15-minute weekly walks. Thank you for joining us today for a weekly walk here in Central Park, and I have a really fun weekly walk in store for you today where we're going to be exploring music in the park. Now, music in the park really transverses so many different mediums and areas, but we're going to focus on more largely audible or audio-based music, talking about just a few of the many performance sites that exist throughout Central Park, as well as some of the famed performances that have occurred here over the many years of this 160-plus year park's existence. Um, as we jump into our weekly walk today, Music in the Park with me, Ryan, on June 1st, 2022, I do want to thank you for again joining us and for supporting us here at the Central Park Conservancy. Who many of you may be familiar with, we're the nonprofit private organization that has been overseeing and caring for the park since 1980, helping to restore and manage the park, keeping it clean and green, and preserving it as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life enhancing the enjoyment of well and well-being of all, which we certainly couldn't do without your help. We do want to thank you for your support on not only virtual programs, but also caring for the park. On our virtual program today, we are using Zoom, so please use the chat feature if you want to let us know where you're joining us from, or maybe share a favorite concert that you potentially were able to attend here in Central Park. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature. My colleague Jose will be on the back end answering any questions you might have. Last thing you'll see pop up are some visitor polls I'll launch throughout the walk. And once everybody has voted in those, I can share the results and see what we're thinking. Last thing you will see, of course, popping up on the bottom of the screen are the live transcripts we're using, to make it a little bit easier for people to read and hear us. Uh, if you do wanna turn those off, you can use the live transcript feature on your toolbar, uh, highlighted in that circle on the very bottom right of this picture. That'll allow you to turn those transcripts off if you don't want to see them. Otherwise, we are going to jump right into our walk as we have a very long walk to take. But luckily, it's pretty cool out here in New York City today with about a 70 degree temperature day compared to the over 90 degree days we were just having just in the past few days. So luckily, very cool for us to walk through the park today and enjoy the wonderful tunes of music. Now, as we explore the park, we're going to be again starting up at 72nd and taking quite a long snake through the park as we stop through just a few of the many sites that have been used for music throughout the park. As we do begin, I do want to launch a poll right off the bat, though, and let everybody vote in that as we begin our walk. It's a simple one. It's just really around music in the park. Have you ever attended a concert in Central Park? And if you have, where have you attended a concert? You'll see I listed many of the sites where music has been performed, but there's some that I wasn't able to fit on there. So I can't wait to hear what everybody has to say for that. I'll let everybody vote in that as we begin our walk, Oop. starting at 72nd Street, right near Strawberry Fields. Also the Women's Gate entrance to the park. And we do have a nice sunny day to walk through the park, but again, a little bit cooler, luckily, not a 90 degree weather day. So we can enjoy the shade, making our way into Strawberry Fields. And right as we enter the park here at 72nd and 5th or 8th Avenue, rather, we're entering into an already musically inspired area. Strawberry Fields, of course, being a memorial to John Lennon, somebody that I probably don't have to describe uh, who he was, but a very influential musician, someone who lived just across the street from here and certainly inspired countless other musicians and artists. Here in Central Park, we find Strawberry Fields opening up um, on October 9th of 1985, what would have been John Lennon's 45th birthday, with one of its main additions being this beautiful centerpiece, its mosaic, crafted from a group of artists in Naples, Italy, bearing one of John Lennon's most famous signature songs in the middle, Imagine. As we walk up, we can see countless different people enjoying the mosaic, as well as always find a musician performing out here. Although this is a quiet zone in the park, 
this little specific area near the mosaic does get a little bit of a pass as we constantly have, of course, a lot of overwhelming support and inspiration from John Lennon, leading to a lot of people performing here. We can see this gentleman on the left adding a little bit of joy to our experience here in Strawberry Fields. And we can also remember again all the other music inspiration that has occurred here, even coming from John Lennon himself, who loved the park so much that him and Yoko would regularly visit this area, as well as shoot a music video here. In, um, the in 1980, actually, just about a month before John Lennon's death, we do see him and Yoko Ono shooting the music video Woman, released on the Double Fantasy album, which came out around November 17th in 1980, filmed really just a few weeks before his tragic death. But we see him taking countless inspiration from the park, again, filming this music video woman here with Yoko Ono, and of course, enjoying the beauty of the park, even during that pre-winter season, as all the trees have lost their leaves. We see Yoko later helping to not only create the memorial to John here, but helping to fix up this area, which during that time was receiving a lot of abuse and damage. As we continue walking through this area today, luckily it's very lush green and very well cared for today thanks to Yoko Ono's donation and the care that we provide by the Central Park Conservancy. As we make our way through the shadowy lush green, we'll continue walking out to a few of the remaining blooms that exist, as well as a lot of commotion that is existing in a more formal area of the park. If you're visiting Central Park today or tomorrow, expect a lot of traffic and crowds near the mall and the Bethesda Terrace area, as well as along the east and west side drives as the JP Morgan Corporate Challenge 5K race is going to be occurring. So you're gonna have a lot of traffic on the east and west drives between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. today and tomorrow if you come in the park. So do plan accordingly. As we make our way a little bit past all this commotion, we can come up to the Bethesda Terrace area. Looking over here, it's very um, fitting that we stop by here as we're exploring this music in the park, because this was actually the site for some original music, or at least it was planned to be. We see one of the park designers, Frederick Law Olmsted, initially wanting to do something pretty interesting with the stage here in the park. He wanted to float it in the lake. Floating stage was a plan that he initially had for Central Park with this little design from 1861 showing us what that may have looked like. We can actually see a little circular image on the left and right that would show where the stage would be displayed while musicians were performing, which we can see here on our left as we zoom in a little bit with that red dot situated just a little to the northwest of the best terrace. When it wasn't in use, it would be situated over near the Loeb Boathouse uh, today, which is over towards the east side of the park, but initially near that two level wooden boathouse that predated the Loeb Boathouse. An interesting idea that never came to fruition. We do see this stage being constructed somewhere a little different. And as we make our way a little south, we can see where that stage would eventually end up. As we travel just across the 72nd Street Drive, we'll come into the mall area just south of Bethesda Terrace. And here we can find a statue of Beethoven, a uh, very famous German composer that I'm sure I don't have to explain who he was, uh, writing countless different um, symphonies, orchestras, and pieces that I'm sure we're quite familiar with. This statue coming around 1884 and actually being donated by the German American Choir Society, helping to add a little bit of representation to the very heavy German community that existed here in America, specifically here in New York during the 1850s as countless Germans are coming over throughout the 30s and 40s. But we see this statue um, being erected and actually accepted by parks commissioners because during its time, it would become the first statue of a musician here in Central Park. We do see a statue of Frederick Schiller being erected a bit earlier but he was more than just a composer. He was a playwright, a, a scientist, a few other things. So Beethoven would serve as the first actual musician getting a statue here in the park. We also would find this to be the location before the statue came of an initial bandstand existing over in this area. This is what would come rather than the floating bandstand that Frederick Law Olmsted had desired. This piece being constructed by a gentleman named Jacob Ray Mould would have beautiful cast iron detailing along with its wooden features. And it would support a wide variety of concerts attended over here in the mall for quite some time. 
we would originally actually see it being located just a little bit more north than where it previously was pictured. We would see actually right down the pathway we walked down initially to come to Beethoven was where we would have found a fountain and this bandstand. We would see it later being relocated a little bit more towards the south where we just saw it pictured in the previous stereograph image. That fountain would also be removed entirely. And much like the fountain, we unfortunately will not see that bandstand in the park anymore because after the wood feature started deteriorating, it was removed entirely. As we make our way a little bit past though, we can see again during the peak of this bandstand's performance, the immense crowds that would be drawn here to see countless different types of performances. This performance, which is pictured here, is coming from, we believe was a um, classical performance or a classical orchestra performing here. Um, these bandstands just having, again, immense amount of use, with concerts traditionally being on Saturdays, as concerts were banned on Sundays up until uh, 1877. This was due because of kind of the Sabbath decorum and rules during the time. But eventually, concerts would be shifted to Sundays to allow people working a six-day work week to have more access. We'd also see shows being shifted to evening. So not only would it be a little bit cooler, but again, more people could come really creating a democratic space here, which we can see from this picture, is certainly getting a lot of heavy use, leading to park designers Calvert Vox creating these wonderfully designed benches we can see pictured on the left to also serve as fences, helping to keep people away from the trees that we certainly wanna keep protected here. As we snap back to present day time, we would see the Nomberg band shell existing here today that would come around 1923 and really come a little bit after or towards the end of the original bandstand's life, helping to allow for larger performances. Although it wouldn't receive too, too many performances, we can see some notable ones occurring here, like um, various different um, series of Nom Nomberg orchestral events, as well as some of my favorites during the late 60s, like in 1969, Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead performing over here. Um, we can actually see this still being used a few times each year for a lot of local performances, such as Stella Blues Band, which continues that live Grateful Dead in the park for free every year um, in support of River Keepers, an organization put together to help clean up the Hudson River. As we come up here, I do want to actually share that poll that I launched a little while ago. Excuse me. And it looks like luckily a lot of people have had the opportunity to come to a concert in Central Park, which I'm very happy to see. And looking over the list, I'm seeing you people, a lot of people coming to shows on the Great Lawn. That seems to be the winner. And we'll, so we'll soon learn why, as well as the summer stage. I don't see too many people having had the opportunity uh, to go to the Sheet Meadow shows or um, Walman Rink shows. You might not know that Walman Rink had concerts, but we'll learn that in just a little bit. Uh, the Great Hill, you might have been able to see um, great jazz on the Great Hill. In the Harlem Mirror, you can find the Harlem Mirror Performance Festival. A couple other, again, different types of concert offerings here in Central Park. So really cool to see that a lot of people have attended shows and a pretty wide different array of venues too. The Nomberg Band Shell, which I see some people have had the pleasure of attending shows at, looks a little bit uh, crowded right now because of the race, but it also looks a lot nicer now because it recently underwent a restoration. Just about a year or so ago, this is what you would have seen if you came to the Nomberg Band Shell. But luckily in 2021, we would complete a restoration project of this, bringing it back to life, restoring that limestone, allowing for the facade and all of the different areas of this beautiful band shell to be restored so performances continue, can continue to be held here. And we can see some of these amazing photos of the restoration work where scaffolding was set up throughout the entirety of this to allow workers to come up and really inspect and care for this limestone up close and in detail. And of course, it looks immaculate today if you come. And this is one of the few stages in Central Park that you can just come right up onto and maybe do a little monologue or performance while you're in the park. So certainly stop by this area and enjoy the new, uh, new Nomberg band shell as it's all fresh and clean. As we make our way south, we'll come to our last two or three stops, making our way down the mall a little bit and thinking about all of the concerts that would be held around here. Even after the band shell or before the band shell, we'd see seats being set up along here as outdoor concerts were very common to find in the park. As we make our way south now, we can continue this by seeing a lot of local performers setting up. 
You can see a musician picture on the right here who is taking a much deserved break. Uh, this saxophonist, a performer I see in the park all the time. He is a staple of the mall and I feel like he's one of the very comforting sights you'll see and sounds you'll hear as you stroll throughout the mall and throughout Central Park experiencing many different public performers that are coming and setting up in a lot of different archways or public areas so people can enjoy their experience in park. As we make our way just to the west, we'll come out to one of the most famous landscapes in Central Park, Manhattan's backyard, Sheep Meadow. And as we make our way onto Sheep Meadow, we can notice a very different site than we would have seen just a just uh, two or three days ago. Coming out here on Memorial Day weekend, this place would have been quite crowded, even with all the brutal heat. We would have certainly seen this quite jam-packed, but today, looking very empty, giving us a little opportunity to spread out on this large meadow. This area, of course, once containing sheep, as its name might imply, but later really just going on to contain a lot of people as this would host countless different events from activism to, of course, large scale concerts. Looking towards the southeast in this corner, we would have at one point throughout a lot of the 60s and 70s seen big stages set up over here or sometimes much smaller stages, but set up in this southeastern corner facing out to countless large crowds. Like some of the first large concerts to occur here in the 1960s, primarily one of them being the New York Philharmonic. The New York Philharmonic today is a staple in annual performances throughout all five boroughs of New York City. But this tradition would start back in 1965 here in Central Park on, the, on Sheet Meadow. Uh, this would actually begin because in 1964, the New York Philharmonic was um, sponsored by the Schlitz Brewing Company to play a show in Milwaukee. This performance in a local Milwaukee park attracted upwards of 30,000 people to see the New York Philharmonic. This prompted the New York Philharmonic upon returning to New York to say, we should do something like this in New York, which we see occurring the following year in 1965. This attracting a crowd of, um, I believe, attracted a crowd of about 40 to 50,000 people, but that number would continue growing. And by about the late 1800s, uh, or rather by about the um, 1970s or so, we see um, we see these performances real, or sorry, during the, during the um, later years, or during the later 1970s, rather, we see these performances reaching numbers of upwards of about 110,000, I think, during the peak New York Philharmonic performance, but attracting large crowds that would continue this tradition. We see concerts, of course, continuing at Sheep Meadow with much larger um, national and worldwide names coming, like Barbara Streisand, who in 1967 would hold probably the first large-scale concert on Sheet Meadow, which would attract upwards of about uh, 135,000 people estimated. Uh, this was a nice two hour performance on a very minimalist stage as we can see here, but of course attracting just countless people to this amazing park. These performances would continue throughout the 1960s and 70s, and we would actually see around 1979, the last large scale performance occurring on Sheet Meadow. Um, in between different things like the airing of the moon landing, different protests, different activism, as well as more concerts. But the last large scale concert would be James Taylor performing in 1979 to a crowd estimated to be about 250,000 people. Here in this photo, we see May, uh, then Congressman Ed Koch, who would later become mayor, mingling with some of the New York citizens attending the concert. Uh, this concert actually, beyond just being a fun event for the public, was also meant to raise awareness for Central Park, which was really deteriorated at that point. Uh, ironically, areas like Sheet Meadow were worn down because of large scale concerts like this. But this concert helped to generate, again, support for Central Park, eventually leading to even things like the formation of the Central Park Conservancy, but allowing for, again, awareness to be brought to this park, which really needed it during that time. After this concert, we see concerts being banned from Sheep Meadow and being moved to another location that I saw from our last poll, a lot of people have attended, the Great Lawn. 
which would be created around the 1930s, being completed about 1937, eventually getting large scale concerts coming to it after 1980. During that time and during Mayor Ed Koch's um, mayoral reign, we see him hosting two large scale performances on the Great Lawn, one being Elton John, and another being one that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, Paul Simon and Art Gar Garfunkel performing as Simon and Garfunkel on the Great Lawn to a crowd of, this number always ranges from roughly 250,000 upwards to 500,000 people. Again, these were rough estimates taken by the police, so nobody knows for sure exactly how many people attended these shows. But of course, a lot of support as we see um, Simon and Garfunkel here with Ed Koch with the Delacorte Theater in the background. Back then, the concert stage was actually set up on the south end of uh, the Great Lawn and performed north. Today, you'll see large-scale concerts occurring on the Great Lawn, but with an opposite stage set up. Here we can see a photo that shows the um, Global Citizen Festival, a festival that's been occurring for the past 10 to 12 years or so here in Central Park with the mission of reducing or eliminating global poverty by 2030, allowing participants to gain free tickets to these performances of worldwide performers just by completing actions like signing petitions and raising awareness. Very similar to like James Taylor's concert back in 1979, raising awareness for issues that are important. So we see this musical tradition continuing in Central Park, just shifting venues a little bit. As we continue back to present day time, back to Sheet Meadow, we can make our way a little south to visit our last two stops. Going down south, we're gonna make our way to a landscape that I'm sure a lot of people might not have realized had concerts. Wrapping just down the path, making our way past Chess and Checkers and the Dairy Visitor Center, we come up to Wolman Rink, which is, as many people know, a nice skating rink, but looking very different here today. As we can see, it almost looks like there is a stage being set up. What we see here is um, what is, I believe, getting transformed into the newest addition or arrival to Woolman Rink, a roller skating kind of, uh, not roller skating derby, but rather a kind of roller, roller blading rink occurring here during the summer that will perform, in, uh, perform and feature potentially DJs, musicians, and a lot of upbeat energy as people skate around and enjoy the landscape. We can actually see this being set for what looks like a musical performance, which is very fitting because some of you may know that Woolman Rink was much more than just a skating rink. Throughout the 60s, you would have found some very amazing events occurring here, such as the Schaefer Concert Series. The Schaefer Concert Series, or as it was known, the Schaefer Music Festival, ran between 1967 and 1976. Later, it would be picked up by Dr. Pepper, which would operate it from about 1977 up until about 1981, when it would be moved to Pier 84 because of things like noise complaints and crowds a bit. But we see this amazing uh, music festival just being, uh, just really bringing amazing, incredible acts to Central Park. The picture we see here is Judy Collins performing around 1973, but we would see phenomenal acts ranging from Janis Joplin to Jimi Hendrix to Led Zeppelin, various styles of big bands, really just musicians from all over the world. Bob Marley would play here at bringing in one of the largest crowds I believe the Schaefer Music Festival had ever seen in the 1970s, but just bringing in tremendous amounts of people and at an affordable price, being sponsored by the Schaefer Beer Company. Company. This event was estimated to cost roughly $500,000 uh, annually. Schaefer would donate about $250,000 to $300,000 to offset the cost for this to allow tickets to be sold for about a dollar or two because they knew that charging two, three, four, five dollars would be much too much for most of the population of New York that would be attending these concerts. So keeping it affordable allowed more people to experience these world-class acts. Of course, over the years, the prices do go up, but in the initial years, we see the prices being really just about under a dollar or so. The festival, again, continuing throughout the 70s. Some examples of ticket stubs here, when it was Schaefer up top, and then again, later, Dr. Pepper taking it over around 1977, but bringing in just amazing world-class acts. 
as we exit this area, we can look over the hillside, which would allow a lot of people that might not have had the opportunity to get a ticket to still enjoy the show and enjoy the beautiful sounds coming off this venue. One that, again, a lot of people never realized existed here, but a fun little secret that once existed at Woolman Rink. As we make our way to our last location, I would like to launch the last poll, which is genre of choice. What genre of music do you think makes the best soundtrack for Central Park? Now, I could only fit so many types of genres here. So if there is another one that you might suggest you think that fits better, please drop that in the chat because I'd love to see what genres most stick out to you. So as I let everybody vote in that, we'll make our way to our very last stop, wrapping just north now up the path quite a bit. And as we make our way up, we encounter a few barriers. These barriers seem a little out of place. They're not here for the upcoming JP Morgan corporate challenge, but rather to get us ready for concert season at the Central Park Summer Stage. Today, the City Parks Foundation supports um, quite a few different summer stages throughout various, uh, throughout all the boroughs of New York, as well as throughout various different parks in these boroughs. These performances put on largely free performances for New Yorkers and people visiting to come enjoy. Uh, beyond that, we also see some paid performances which help to continue to support free performances throughout all of New York City. Central Park Summer Stage is the flagship stage we see for this whole program. And we can see it here, mostly set up and ready to go as concert season begins in just three days. June 4th, I believe, is the first concert to take place here. Um, followed by, I think, June 8th, and then, of course, plenty others coming as we start off with a few benefit shows to kick off the free concert season, which begins in just about a week or two. But this amazing venue, of course, has taken quite a few changes over the years. Interestingly enough, the Central Park Summer Stage was actually started by the Central Park Conservancy back in 1986. We would later see this being um, taken over by the City Parks Foundation. But initially, we would see concerts being held at Nomberg Vanshell, pictured just in the bottom right of this aerial photo of Rumsey Playfield, the Summer Stage, and the Nomberg Vanshell. We'd see City Parks taking over sponsorship of this event and operating it in 1994, and they continue to do so today. We'd also see this area receiving some upgrades over the years, as more recently, we would see some additions being changed up in the summer stage area, allowing for a better artist hospitality area and more room for people, allowing a capacity raise of 20%. So now we can see upwards of 5,500 people enjoying shows here in Central Park. And of course, plenty of different performances have occurred throughout all five boroughs and throughout really all summer stages, bringing amazing acts like Buddy Guy, who you can see playing here, jumping off the stage and performing in the group of people. Certainly a very memorable experience here, pictured back in 1990. Countless amazing performers would um, continue to play here. Uh, we see Curtis Mayfield actually doing one of his very last performances in 1990, around the 1990s, but a lot of amazing acts that range from not only music and concerts, but also different types of art acts and cultural events. We see pictured here the Clark Center's 60th anniversary tribute headlined by Phila Danko, but some amazing performances that'll bring out again, different arts, even cultural festivals like the Aussie BBQ, um, an event sponsored by the Australian Consulate here in New York. That again, brings out things like food trucks, performers and artists from these different nations to help support those populations living here and experience, um, bring to New Yorkers and people abroad, again, a new type of experience, cultural awakening. As we come to the end of our tour, I do wanna remind you that again, there's plenty of other music to witness in Central Park. And as we jump briefly up north, we can look at one of the performances put on by us here at the Central Park Conservancy, the Harlem Mirror Performance Festivals, which have been occurring since about 1993 or 1994. Uh, these events, which we put on for the past about almost 20 years or so, or over 20 years actually, um, have, uh, have brought in local performers from all different areas of New York to perform up here in Central Park for the 
Of course, patrons of the park to come and enjoy for free, dancing around or sitting along the Harlem Mirror, a beautiful landscape that allows everybody to, again, not only get the beauty of the park, but also get the amazing songs and sounds of these different performers, again, ranging in genre. And as we enjoy these types of festivals, we will enjoy the return of the Harlem Mirror Performance Festival, which is going to be coming back in just a few weeks. This festival um, does typically run from Father's Day up until about the general, generally Labor Day time. So we can find these every Sunday from Father's Day to Labor Day throughout um, the summer months here in Central Park, located up near the Harlem Mirror at about 110th Street and Fifth Avenue. Of course, a lot of fun. And as you check the chat, my colleague Jose will drop a link for some of these upcoming programs like the um, Harlem Mirror Performance Festival, which doesn't have its schedule released just yet, but that will be coming on June 15th, I believe, is when that schedule gets released. So check back on our website for that. You can also check on other different events that should be occurring, like Great Jazz on the Great Hill, of course, a wonderful collection of shows at the City Parks Foundation Summer Stage, which can be found throughout all five boroughs of New York, and countless other just private performers that set up in the park. So as we do come to the end of our walk, I do want to thank you for taking this long walk with us, experiencing just a handful of the musically um, amazing locations in the park. And I want to encourage you to get out into the park and to experience some music for yourself. Of course, always plenty of uh, things to see and to hear in Central Park. So we do want to thank you for joining us. Again, keeping an eye on the chat, you'll find some links for upcoming programs like this month of June, happy June 1st, we will be launching a Pride in Central Park virtual and in-person tours. So you can keep an eye out for those which are going to be um, again, on our website and found within the link in the chat box. I'm going to keep the room open for a little bit longer for any of those who do have questions still available. Uh, but from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and remind everybody, of course, enjoy the park, care for the park, and care for each other. Thank you again. Remind, uh, remind you the park needs us and we need the park. So of course, what is it that you like about Central Park? What do you need the most? Let us know when the park needs us using that hashtag. We'll feature on our social media channels. But of course, we look forward to seeing you on more virtual and in-person programs. So from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.